ใช่ unmuted That or I'll leave it to you whenever you feel like it's time to start. Are we ready to go? We got uh, okay. Let's uh, let me get my stuff. <clears throat> up. Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome uh, to this tech talk. This is going to be a fantastic one. All things exterior applications and installations. I want to thank you for taking the time. My name is Bader Sally. I'm the chair of the Tech Talk Committee at TTMAC. Um, and I'm going to introduce our speakers today. We have two fantastic speakers. We're lucky to have them. Um, a, a lot of experience here. So let's start. We got Rob Uzi, who started his career in 2003 and has spent 16 years as a Red Seal certified journeyman installing various floor coverings for these years. <clears throat> He specializes in resilient flooring and commercial and institutional projects like hospitals. Uh, he joined my pay back in 2019 as a regional technical rep for Western Canada, and he covers their tile and stone and floor covering products and specializes in in-floor heating products. Uh, he'll be talking about the uh, practical aspect of installation today. We also have our good friend, uh, Paul Luchichero who has a Bachelor of Science and a graduate from the University of Guelph with a major in biochemistry. He's a smart guy. Very career from cardiac research to pharmaceuticals to chemicals. Uh, he works at MAPE for the last 16 years as an architectural sustainability specialist for tile and stone installation systems, floor covering installation systems, and concrete restoration systems. He sits on the TTMAC Specification and Technical Research Committee as a lead AP, BD, and C since 2009, certified as a technical representative uh, from the Construction Specifications Canada since 2012, and he generates specifications and CAD details from a pay. So that was a lot of information. We got two fantastic gentlemen here. Uh, we're happy to have them. We're lucky to have them. And I, I will now, Rob, uh, sorry, take who's starting first. Rob's very capable of that. So Rob, take it away, sir. It's all yours. All right, sounds good. Uh, let's get my screen up. All right, hopefully everybody can see that. Uh, all right, I, uh, oh, hold on a sec. I've got something happening in my headset. Can we make sure everyone's online has their mic muted, please? I'm going to go back on stage, but I want to go up to Andrew for a second. Oh, the doors on. All right. The uh, I, I was just gonna say that the uh, steamer is thirty-two centimeters tall. Okay. So if we put the bottom shelf at around forty centimeters. Yeah. Oh, then okay. then We've lost Robert. Where'd he go? There we go. All right. Okay, let's try that again. Hopefully you guys can hear me now. Uh, I just want to say thank you all for attending today. Uh, as mentioned, my name is Rob Uzi, and along with my Paul, my co colleague Paul, we're going to discuss exterior tile installations. 
So I'm going to start by talking about the best tile practices and standards for ensuring that your tile installation lasts for years. I'm going to go over some things to look for when you first arrive on a job site, delve into some general substrate requirements, uh, and throughout the presentation, we'll kind of address common challenges encountered while installing, particularly in like the varying seasonal conditions like summer heat, winter cold. Uh, I will also emphasize the critical role that movement joints play in preventing potential issues. And finally, just kind of touch on like how we should be storing our products um, kind of in these temperature changes. So first, when we arrive on the job site, it's important to give the area like a thorough examination before you start anything. Inspect the area around the building as well as the building itself for anything that may cause issues or, or future failures. Take a good look at the walls or deck. Uh, make sure that everything is, you know, solid, stable, flat, plumb and true, and of course dry. For the area around the building, you look for like any potential like grading issues, grading or sloping issues, any planters, speaker systems or gutters that may like pose moisture issues down the line. Make sure you pr also present any of these findings in writing to the general contractor and, and make sure you don't start work until they're addressed. Uh, and I'm sure you've heard this a thousand times, but all substrates we're going to install tile onto need to be clean and free of any bond breaking substance. So this is things like concrete sealers, curing agents, dust, dirt, paints, oils, waxes, etc. Uh, we do not recommend the use of any chemical removal methods. That's mostly because even with a thorough wash, these chemicals will still soak into your substrate and they will prevent bonding with any products that are used over top of them. So you should be mechanically removing these contaminants and loose toppings. Um, tools like hand grinders, methods like shot blasting, sand blasting, even power washing are good choices. If you were working with a concrete surface or concrete substrate, we also need to make sure that it's properly prepared with the correct concrete surface profile or CSP for the products that we'll be using. For example, if we're doing like a directly bonded mortar bed, your concrete surface pro your concrete could require a CSP of five all the way up to nine. So it's important to double check the products you're using and make sure that you you get these substrates prepared properly. All supporting surfaces need to be flat, plumb, true, and dry. Uh, if they aren't, and we install over the top of them, you know, we'll get at best a wavy floor or an ugly tripping hazard. And at worst, we could actually be creating areas for water to pool, which will lead to moisture issues in the near future. Uh, so for us, this means that the standard is that any variations in the substrate do not exceed six millimeters and three meters or 10 feet for regular tiles. And if we're using large and heavy tiles, the substrate variation gets much stricter and, and we cannot exceed by half. So three millimeters and three meters or 10 feet. Uh, we also need to make sure that we watch the surface variations in like shorter distances as well. So over the span of a foot, we need to make sure that we're not getting any like dips lower than two meters for regular tiles. Um, and any more than 1.5 meters in two feet or 600 millimeters for large and heavier tiles. When we're installing on exterior walls and facades, any installations that are higher than three meters or 10 feet must be designed and guaranteed by the tile manufacturer. So when working with large and heavy tile, special considerations need to be taken into account so that we don't end up with tile falling off the side of the building and injuring someone. Uh, this is a bit of a long blurb, so bear with me and then I'll kind of break it down a little bit. But the 2021 International Building Code states that adhered units weighing more than three and a half pounds per square foot shall not exceed 48 inches or two feet in any face dimension and should not weigh more than, or sorry, and be more no more than nine square feet in the total face area. And they cannot weigh more than six pounds, any more than that, and we'll have to fasten it. Um, this also states that any adhered units that are weighing less than or equal to three and a half pounds per square foot should not exceed three feet 
in any face dimension and no more than 17 and a half square feet in total face area. So basically this just means if your tile is heavier than three and a half pounds per square foot, we can't have any, we can't have a side longer than two feet and it cannot weigh more than six pounds per square foot. If it does, it needs to be designed and we're probably using a fastener. Um, this does also mean that if it's a little bit lighter than three and a half pounds, we can go a little bit bigger without having any, you know, without having to get it designed and, and guaranteed and stuff like that. So I like, as you can see, higher installations as well, heavier and larger tiles, they do need to be designed and guaranteed by the tile manufacturer and even architects in some cases. Another thing we need to consider when tiling exterior walls is of course like water or, and moisture getting behind the tile assembly. So we need to make sure that like all cuts and openings are treated to ensure proper waterproofing. Then this is just so that water doesn't get in behind the walls and causes issues. We need to make sure that proper flashing is also done so that water that does get behind the walls is redirected out of the walls. Um, and this is also, this is something that should also be kind of designed and specified by a consultant. Uh, weep holes are added to like where basically where like the tile meets the foundation. And this is just to ensure that any water or moisture that does again get behind the tile can also safely get out before it causes any problems. Because I'm sure as we all know, when water freezes, it expands. And that is not really great for tile installations. Um, so the standard for weep holes, um, basically that any tile installations that use a direct bond with a thin set need weep holes in the grout joints every two feet or 600 millimeters. Um, and they need to be about 13 millimeters long. And it's just an ungrouted joint. Uh, a, a good example of this is if we take a look at like brick buildings, when you see like where the brick meets the foundation, you'll end up seeing these big holes kind of every, every so often. And that's, that's the reason that they're just weep holes. Uh, when working on horizontal surfaces like decks, one of the major causes of moisture related problems is really just improper sloping. Um, we need to make sure that everything is sloped away from the house or towards drains at a slope of about 2%, which works out to about six millimeters for every foot or 300 millimeters. Uh, improper sloping can lead to things like major house foundation repairs, basement floods. Um, it can lead to the pooling of water on the surface of the tile, creating a slippery walkway. Pooled water in the winter can obviously also mean that any water that is penetrated in the tiles below could be freezing and then obviously causing our installation to fail. Uh, another thing to keep in mind is that if we're installing over a garage or other occupied area, uh, we need to make sure that we have proper waterproofing membranes and drainage mat to ensure that we don't have any water getting into your area below. Uh, and this is one of these things that still surprises me as to how many exterior tiles failures I see. Um, they could have really just been avoided with proper movement joints. It, when we don't provide proper movement joints and allow the substrate and all the materials used to expand and contract, it is a recipe for, for failure. Like you can see in the pinchers, your tiles will start to peak. They will debond. You'll get like this odd hollow sound underneath it. And in some cases, they can literally explode off the floor. There's a fairly famous YouTube video um, that takes place in a mall where all of a sudden like there's people shopping and then you just hear like what sounds like gunshots. And then you literally start seeing the tiles just flipping up off the floor. And that's all because of the stress that was put onto them because they didn't have movement joints. <clears throat> so movement joints, again, is one of those things that should always be specified by an architect or consultant. Uh, the movement joints should continue, usually, usually continue through the tile and through the setting materials and at least partially through the substrate in the case of control joints. Um, in exterior applications, it's a little bit more, it's a lot more stringent than interior applications. And we need movement joints every 2.4 meters to 3.6 meters. That's eight to 12 feet. And they need to be at minimum of 10 meters, millimeters wide and obviously filled with an appropriate sealant. Now, if we live in areas that see more than a 40 degree difference between the summer highs and the winter lows, your movement joints actually need to increase to a minimum of 13 millimeters to accommodate for the extra movement due to the temperature swings. And like, let's be honest, that's basically the majority of Canada now. Uh, even in Vancouver where I am, which is considered very temperate uh, as far as Canada goes, 
We saw highs over 30 degrees last summer and we fell below 10 degrees this winter. Would that means we should be using movement joints in this area now that are 13 millimeters. So we need to make sure, we also need to make sure that every change of plane is treated like an expansion contraction joint. So things like inside corners, and they obviously need to be filled with an appropriate sealant as well. I, I can't tell you how many people I still see putting grout in those areas and it, it drives me nuts. If you put grout in a change of plane, it's just gonna crack and pop out. And then you're gonna get water issues. So continuing with some major reasons for failures of exterior tile jobs, coverage, coverage, coverage. It is required that thin set coverage outside be a minimum of 95%. And just like in plane, just like changes in plane being grouted, I can't believe this is still like an, an, an issue to the extent that it is. Um, if we do not meet the minimum coverage, you're going to end up with voids behind your tiles. This will decrease your bond strength and it will also provide a place for water and moisture to gather. Come winter, that water will freeze, it will expand, and it will pop your tiles off the substrate. It also creates weak points underneath the tile. And if anything hits that spot, it's just going to shatter the tile. So what can we do? You can do things like periodically lift your tiles to make sure you're getting proper coverage, like the tile in the photo. Uh, key your thin stretch thin set into the substrate. This will help fill any like small voids, allowing for a better mechanical bond. You can back butter your tiles. And just like keying the, a thin set into a substrate, this will force the thin set into any small voids or uneven spaces on the back of the tile. And again, this will allow for a better mechanical bond and allow you to achieve higher coverage consistently. Uh, we always travel in one direction when we're installing tiles. And then when you install them, you push and then you wiggle perpendicular to the trowel line. And this also guarantees that we're going to properly collapse all of the ridges. Um, and of course, another important one is to honestly just follow the directions on the thin sets. This will help you ensure that you're getting a proper consistency so that all those ridges collapse easily. For example, if you end up mixing your thin set too thick, you won't be able to collapse the ridges, which means we're going to end up with voids under our tiles. And that's bad. Um, something else I feel like I shouldn't really even have to mention, but we still see it popping up all the time today is no spot. Don't spot bond. Don't spot on ever. There's just, there's really no excuse for it. Um, you will have poor load distribution. You will have very reduced bond strength, which will just end up leading to your tiles filing off the walls. Again, we'll get voids. We'll have huge voids. And these will be weak points that will lead to the tile cracking if anything hits the tile in those areas. And again, voids will also are also allowing a place for water and moisture to gather, which create issues in the winter and a possible place, obviously, for mold to grow. Please don't, don't spot bond. Um, so something I do see that's kind of like overlooked that I can kind of understand a little bit is we don't really check our tiles to make sure that they're clean coming from the factory. So a lot of times there's actually like a dust or release agents that are still present on the back of the factory tiles. So it's a good idea to check your tiles out and give them a clean before we install them. If we don't, then basically what it is is that thin, your thin set is just going to stick to the dust or release agents on the back. And it's not really going to get a proper bond to the tiles that we're installing and well, obviously, we know that's going to lead to some issues. Uh, when we're working in the hotter and cooler months, obviously, we need to take special considerations because of the extreme temperatures we're going to go through. Um, days where it's colder than 12 degrees Celsius or hotter than 36 degrees can have just negative effects on cement-based products that can cause failures. And when we're using epoxies, it's a little more stricter. Um, if temperatures start to fall below 16 degrees Celsius and, 32 de and hotter than 32 degrees Celsius, they can actually have like negative effects on the curing process by either slowing it down too much or even sp or speeding it up way too fast. And then it's just gonna set up in the bucket and you'll end up throwing out a whole bunch of epoxy. Uh, and when we're working in the summer months, there's some things we need, we can do to help kind of protect our work. 
Uh, the first thing we can do is to obviously, again, check the specifications on the products you're using. Then this is for, we're going to be checking them for their at temp application temperature ranges. Uh, when it gets too hot out, you might need to do something like tarp off the work area. This will protect it from direct sunlight, create shade, which will kind of cool the area down a little bit. It will also help protect it from any warm breezes that might come in. Uh, this will help keep your thin sets from like skidding over while it's on the wall waiting for a tile to go on it uh, or flashing off just too fast in the bucket when you're trying to use it. Uh, so you may, need to, you may even need to do things like just work in the cooler part of the days, work first thing in the morning, take a break in the, you know, in the middle of the day and then work in the evening again, maybe when things cool off. Uh, not very fun to do, but we, sometimes we got to do what we got to do. Uh, and if and and make sure that if we do need to tarp off the area, that it's done like you know like a couple days before and a couple days after, or however many days the manufacturer of the products you're using to protect the area after. But you don't really want to do it as you're about to install it because the area is still going to be hot, like it was just sitting in the sun. So it's best to do it a little bit before, so you can kind of get the whole area cooled down a bit. Uh, when we're working with higher temperatures, we also need to pay attention to the water that we're using. If you're using a, a product that mixes with just water, I feel like this, this one gets overlooked quite a bit. Uh, not only do we need to make sure the water is potable so that there's no like dirt or unwanted minerals in it that may actually affect your products during the curing process, but we also need to make sure that the water isn't too hot. Um, so the photos in this slide provide a pretty good example of why we need to watch the temperature of the water. So the day that this, these were taken, it was about 30 degrees Celsius outside. Uh, we poured water into a bucket to use for mixing. And then we took the temperature of that water. Well, surprise, surprise, the sunlight had actually heated up the water in the hose to almost 49 degrees Celsius. So for a good contrast, like a good water temperature for water is probably somewhere around 10 degrees. So as you could imagine, using that water would significantly decrease the pot life of your thin sets, borders, or grouts. Hot temperatures obviously create dry conditions in which substrates or even tiles may be stealing or evaporating the water that your thin set needs to properly cure. Uh, we recommend a method called SSD or saturated surface dry. This method can not only help cool the surface down a bit, but it can actually provide a bit of extra moisture, ensuring your thin set doesn't lose any water it needs during the curing process. Um, this is done basically just by dampening the surface of the substrate uh, and even the back of the tile with something like, you know, like one of those little hand pump sprayers, uh, a towel, a sponge works, works really good. Uh, it's also good to keep in mind that we're just dampening it. We're, we're not flooding the water. We don't want any standing water. You don't want too much water to look like it's on top of anything just that it kind of turns that like darker color that it looks like it's wet. Uh, so some, summer is one challenge, but winter, especially in Canada, is another challenge. When it comes to the winter months and cooler temperatures, we need to battle ice and below freezing temperatures. So this may mean something like, again, you may need to hoard or tarp off your area and actually heat it for the duration of the installation and curing process. Again, check the manufacturer's specifications. There should be some sort of a guideline for how long they protect it from freezing temperatures. Um, again, thin set coverage becomes critical. Any voids left behind the tile will let water gather. And when water freezes, it expands and that will damage our tile and, and cause failures. And the thing about winter is it, it, if you can't get it heated, then it might just not be possible to install at that time of the year and you'll just have to tell the homeowner or contractor you need to wait for warmer weather sometimes there just isn't a cost effective way to work in the winter uh and the last thing i actually wanted to touch on today was something else i think gets kind of overlooked way too often and that's actually where your product is being stored or where it's being kept and that's even for short periods of time uh whether it's winter or summer obviously we shouldn't be leaving any products outside unless you are maybe in the middle of using them. Letting products freeze outside could impact their bond strength after cured. Um, and leaving products baking in the sun, again, just like we saw with the water heating up, um, it will greatly accelerate the curing process. Um, 
I don't know if you've ever like mixed a bag of concrete patch or something like that and watch it like kick off and dry almost as fast as you mix, mix it. Well, I know my personal experience, it turned out because we were just leaving the product in the direct sun and we weren't really paying attention. Um, another good example is we even ship most of our products to our distributors using climate controlled containers. Uh, and this is to make sure that they don't experience any, you know, ex extreme temperature changes that are going to damage the products. Uh, and this, in, okay, and in this slide, this is actually a good example. Uh, the photos in this side are of the same product, but they were taken at two different times. The, the left photo is when the thin set was picked up at the warehouse. And the second picture, the one on the right, was before it was unloaded at a job site. So I believe it was about 27 degrees outside that day. Um, these photos were taken about 25 minutes apart. And as you can see, the product rose over 20 degrees from 48 to, sorry, rose over 20 degrees to 48 degrees Celsius just from sitting in the sun on the ride home and for a few minutes in the back of the truck before it actually got taken inside. Now, if we mix that at that temperature, the pot life of that product would be significantly reduced. Uh, and I always recommend a like just getting like a cheap IR gun. It's the an amazing tool to measure the temperatures of the products you're using, the substrates, and even your mixing liquids, just to make sure that they're at a decent temperature before we use them. So as you see, tiling outside has a lot of challenges. Height of installations, size and weight of tiles are all things that need to be kept in mind. And while th things like proper sloping, movement joints and coverage are critical, so are the things like the temperature of your work area, the temperature you're storing your products at, and the temperature you're using your products at, or the temperature of the products you're using. Um, and that's the conclusion of my half of the presentation. I will let Paul take it from here. Thank you, Rob. Uh, before Paul gets started, I just want to remind everybody that if you have any questions, please leave them in the chat bar and uh, we'll get to them after. Okay, take it away, Paul. All righties going technology from beginning there we go okay good afternoon and good morning to some of you so now that um rob did an excellent presentation on the do's and don'ts and all the different factors outside i'm going to talk about the materials which are the best materials to use outside don't mind me i'm italian i could use a lot of my hands in my presentation all right, so today we want to talk about, in my part of the presentation, we want to talk about, well, some of this stuff is going to overlap from what Rob said. We're going to talk about the different uh, different factors outside that can affect a tile installation. Uh, we're going to talk about mortars, which are the best suited mortars and the importance of latex and how uh, it works um, to make mortars better suited for exterior installations. And then again, we'll go into grouts which ones are best suited, and not only why, just which ones are best suited, but why are they best suited outside. And then we're going to talk about waterproofing membranes, why are we using them outside, and of course, which ones are the best ones to be used in certain types of installations outside. So very important slide here, very important quote. It starts with the weather, it ends with the weather, meaning that not only do you have to consider the installation, what the, the weather during the installation, but throughout the whole cycle, the life cycle of the installation. Because uh, you're gonna have throughout the years, you're gonna have wind loads on building facades. Uh, you know, so we, we have some, some wacky weather nowadays, uh, torrential downpours. Uh, even if you look at, uh, I mean, in my neck of the region, just this month, we had a week of minus 20 to minus 25 degrees centigrade. And all of a sudden it went up to 10 degrees the next week. Right, so that causes a lot, a lot of stress in the tile system. So it's not like you got to consider what Rob talked about during the installation, but you also got to consider the whole life cycle. And we're going to talk about why you're using certain materials because you have to consider all the different types of factors throughout the life cycle of the tile installation. And some of these factors on the exterior tiles is, of course, the thermal expansion. Everything expands and contracts at different rates. Right. And of course, like I mentioned, with the wacky weather we have, it's not just the summer highs and winter lows, but it's also in winter. You can have, you know, in the minus 20s and next week is going to be is going to be like uh, like springtime. 
So you got to consider all these stresses on the tile system uh, and all the different components in the tile system and exterior applications. Uh, even rain on hot tile, you can have a, a summer day where it's 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 extremely hot. You know, up in the up in the 30s, and all of a sudden you get that big rainfall coming down, and that's going to cool down the tile tremendously. And of course, that's going to create a lot of havoc on the stress of the system. Uh, we're going to talk about expansion fatigue because obviously with all that expansion contraction, uh, so, so some of these mortars, grouts, or even tiles, they can have this called, what's called expansion fatigue and, and they can't take that stress and you get a tile installation failure. And of course, building movement because the mortar, the grout, the tile all move at a different rate. But of course, in a building facade or on a deck, the substrate is going to move differently than the, the whole tile system. Now, in our climate in Canada, you can have um, differential uh, temperature, differential expansion contraction of tile itself, just the tile itself, ranging from 0.2 to 0.4 millimeters. So that means the tile is going to expand and contract between 0.2 and 0.4 millimeters. Doesn't seem like a lot, right? But when you're talking about you know, 4,000, 5,000, even 10,000 square foot of outside uh, installation, that, that, that's going to be a lot of movement in your whole entire tile uh, installation system. So you got to consider that when you're in, when we're talking about mortars, because that mortar is going to have to take up some of that expansion contraction of the tile. Now, here's a nice little graph that uh, on the y-axis tells you the tile size in centimeters. And on the on the x-axis, the change in expansion contraction uh, for, the, for the thermal expansion contraction of the tile. So you see the bigger the tile, I mean, it greatly expands. I mean, the 10 centimeter, 10 centimeter tile, very small tile. You know, you're only looking at, you know, very small amount of movement. And the larger the tile, you're looking at, you know, almost 0.3 millimeters of movement. And of course, the larger the tile, and nowadays tiles are humongous. You have tiles the size of drywall sheets that are being installed on building facades. So you can imagine how much these expand and contract in the weather. Now, it's a little chemistry 101 for everybody. Don't be afraid. I'll be easy on you guys. Uh, but latex on mortars. Why do we have latex in mortars? Well, think of uh, when we say polymer modified mortar and latex modified mortar means the same thing because a latex is a polymer. Think of Legos. Put it very simple. A Lego block is a monomer and then you can build on it and expand it and make it into a whole bunch of different things, uh, branching out, you know, things like that. That's how a polymer works. So you, Doing so will give you different properties of the end polymer product, in this case, latex. So not all latex are created equally. Uh, some are better for exterior applications. Some are just for you know wet environments or indoor where it's all acclimated. But what does latex do to a mortar when you add latex to a mortar? Of course, it makes it more flexible. Any cementitious product you know, doesn't has a very good compressive strength, but as soon as you flex it, it breaks. So the latex will add some of that flexibility. Uh, gives it a little more tensile strength, a bond strength. Uh, it makes it a little more non-porous because it clogs up all these pores that can, can conquer any cementitious product is very porous. So the latex will kind of intertwine inside these pores, inside the cementitious product, and make it more non-porous. And again, it'll make it more chemical resistant because you're clogging up those pores. Chemicals and harmful things can go in there and create havoc in the cementitious product. And there's two methods that tile mortars have latex. You can buy it already with the dry latex because latex it is a solid. It already has the dry powder inside. And all you need to do is add water to that tile mortar. Or you have a non, what's called a non-modified mortar, meaning it's just had sand, cement, and maybe a few additives, but no latex. And then you add this liquid latex that comes in an emulsion. And then you pour it in in lieu of water. And... These ones coalesce much better, which shows on the picture on the right side. So these mortars, they coalesce more uh, into the, integrate more into the, uh, the pores of the cementitious product, which makes it, which makes these kind of uh, characteristics even higher than the ones that have just a dry latex inside of it already added. So this is just, this is not the actual cementitious, but this is just the actual latex that's added to the mortar. So at the top, you see that's the latex, the type of latex that's added to, um, that's, that's already inside the tile mortar. 
it's a little more brittle. It has a bit of flexibility, but it's it's much, much more brittle. And you look at the bottom one, the emulsion ones that you add to the non mitre Ford mortar, much, much, much more flexible. I mean, obviously your mortar is not going to do what that uh, the bottom thing is doing, but that's just latex itself. Uh, like I mentioned, latex is all not created equally. It all depends on um, how it's being manufactured, all the branching and all that kind of stuff will give you different types of uh, properties of the latex. Everybody's familiar with ISO 13007. There's a lot of jargon there, but I'll kind of summarize it. Uh, one of the classifications that ISO 13007, which deals with uh, classification for uh, tiles and uh, tile mortars and grouts, one of them is for tile mortars is the deformability. And the way they class it is an S1 and S2. So you can see the picture in the middle. That's how it's tested. So that's actually a piece of mortar. Um, and then it's cured. And then they have this spindle that pushes down on top of it. And it measures how much it deforms till it snaps. So an S1 mortar will deform uh, 2.5 to 5 millimeters. Two point, up, up to uh, 2.5 and equal to 2.5 and up to five millimeters, but not equal to five millimeters. And an S2 mortar will deform greater than and equal to five millimeters. So that's very important, that the deformability, because that, that acts like a shock absorber to what we talked about, Rob and I, about all those external factors that cause chaos in the tile system, all that expansion, contraction, uh, the heating, the wind loads, and all that kind of stuff outside that we don't get in interior tile application. And then you look at uh, stretching capacity of mortars. So remember what I talked about my first slide, my first few slides, I talked about in northern climates, tiles expand and contract up to 0.2 to 0.4 millimeters in, in, uh, in the summer and the winter. So you need a mortar that's kind of compensate for that kind of movement because everything expands and contracts at a different rate. So if you look at the bottom one, there's your typical cement dry set, which is a non-modified mortar. And then you have your entry level polymer modified mortar that has a dry latex in it. And then you have your flexible mortar systems, which are the higher end of the already uh, um, polymer modified mortars that already has the dry latex in it. And then the super flexible mortars are the ones you add the jug of latex. Those are the ones that are the usually the ISO 13007 S2 mortars. And you see that they that movement is much, much, much higher. It's it's more than double of of all the other kind, all of the even the flexible polymer mortar system. So that's the kind of mortar you need for an exterior application to have that long life of you know. You obviously you don't want to repair your your deck every two or three years. And we also have the ANSI A118.15, um, and the difference between the ANSI A118.15 and the ANSI A118.4 uh, is it has better shear bond strengths. So obviously, for outside applications, you want something that has a better bond strength. So you want a mortar that meets this ANSI standard. And also, the ANSI A118.15 also introduced heat aging. So obviously, not so much of uh, an issue inside, but outside, we have a lot of cold and, and, and heat. You want a mortar that meets that standard because it does test for that heat aging. How much, how much stress could it take from heat aging? But whenever in doubt, no matter what, always ask the manufacturer of the tile mortar. That's what they do. That's what they're there for. And they'll tell you, when in doubt, if you're not sure if it's ready for outside or, you know, depending on the application, talk to the tile, manuf the, uh, the tile mortar manufacturer and they'll tell you, yes, okay, this is your application. Use this mortar. Now we'll go on to routes. Uh, we have, again, we have the ISO 13007 standard and the ANSI standard. So the ANSI standard, we have the A118.6, the standard math, uh, the standard cement grout, and the ANSI A118.7, which is the high-performance grout. And again, for the ISO 13007, we have CG1 and the improved CG2 grouts. Now, the difference between the two for the ANSI standard is the, the high-performance grout, the, 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 most of the, um, the test methods are, well, not the test method, but the test results are the same, but for the high performance grout, it has less absorption than the standard, which is what you want outside. Because as Rob mentioned, if you have any voids, water gets in, freezes, boom. So you want something that has a lot less absorption. So you want one of those ANSI A118.7 high performance grout that has much less absorption. 
And again, the ANSI standard is the flexural strength is much better in the ANSI A118.7 than the A118.6. And that's what you want. You want saw grout that's a little more flexible outside. I can take all that stress from the outside. And the ISO, again, has the same uh, performance, uh, high performance uh, for the improved cement grouts as the, uh, as the abrasive resistance, which uh, the ANSI doesn't measure. But it also has the water absorption, the low water absorption uh, between the improved and the normal. So they kind of overlap in the absorption, but different. ANSI is for flexural strength. ISO for the improved is um, the absorption and the abrasive resistance. So an A118.7 high performance cement grout are typically not Portland cement based grouts. They're typically calcium aluminum, which is a different type of cement. And this cement gives a lot of different benefits to outside installations, like uh, they're faster setting. So the, because they're faster setting, that's what you want outside because you don't know what's going to happen outside, right? It could rain in the next day or even at night. Uh, it could it could get really, really cold. We have some summer nights, actually, the beginning of the summertime, where during the day it's like 30 degrees, 25 degrees, and all of a sudden at night it goes down to like you know 19 degrees. Uh, so you want something that sets faster so it's not affected too much by uh, the outside environments from the fluctuating temperature and heat and cold and rain and whatnot. And again... Uh, Little efflorescence, little to no efflorescence. Efflorescence is that white chalky stuff that's everybody's nightmare coming out of the grout joints because it cures so fast and it is, it is a calcium aluminate, so there's no lime in it like a Portland cement-based product has. You won't get the efflorescence or very little efflorescence. Again, much, much, much lower porosity which is what you want and a better color, color consistency and resistance to staining because of the nature of the beast. But why not use an epoxy grout outside, right? It's much more durable than a cement grout. Why can't I use an epoxy grout outside? Well, it's not so much of a performance issue. It's more of an aesthetic issue because epoxy grouts uh, are susceptible to uh, yellowing from UV radiation, which is the sun. So if it's exposed to the sun, it could yellow and it becomes an aesthetic issue, not a performance issue. But you know what? You can use epoxy grout outside if you really want, if you're doing a pool which is much better because epoxy grouts are 100% solid, no porosity to it. It's much more durable, uh, very color consistent, and much more chemical resistant. In pools, obviously, you throw a bunch of chemicals. Uh, so if you go below the water line, you can use epoxy grouts because UV doesn't penetrate water. So it will have no yellowing of uh, your grout inside below the water line in a pool outside. Waterproof membrane. Again, we have the ANSI and the ISO standards. Uh, you got to make sure there's a whole bunch of different types of uh, waterproof membranes out there. Some of them are, are uh, can only uh, be applied by trowel. Some are uh, roller applied. Some of it are actual membranes, like a stick-on membrane, that kind of thing. Uh, but again, always ask your manufacturer, is your waterproof membrane, when in doubt, is it rated for outside? And to go into more details, give them the actual application, because sometimes some of them, it can be used outside, but you want to step it up because it could be used like in some in some, uh, some areas where there's going to be, you know, some pooling water or some some heavy rain or snow or salt and that kind of stuff. Uh, but why waterproof outside, right? Obviously, you want to deflect that water away from the building, right? Uh, even if you slope, like Rob mentioned, you need a 2% slope. Even if you slope, but you have no waterproof membrane, what's going to happen? The water is going to soak because everything is porous. The mortar is, uh, is somewhat porous. Uh, the tiles can be a little bit porous. Uh, the the grout, the substrate, especially if it's concrete, is porous. So even if you have it sloped, the water is going to soak in there. It's going to stay there. So you want to make sure that you have waterproof the system, so the water hits the waterproof uh, the water hits the waterproof membrane and slopes it away from the structure. Minimize efflorescence, obviously, uh, because if water pools there inside the concrete, it bring the salts up, which I'll talk about a little bit later on, and you'll get that white chalky stuff coming out and out of your grout joints and cause an eyesore. And obviously you want to prevent leaks if you have an, uh, uh, for water penetrating, especially if you see that middle picture, that's a, um, that's a balcony that is over an occupied space. You can see the occupied space underneath here. I don't know if you guys can see my arrow. So if you don't have a waterproof membrane over here and the proper slope, this water is going to cause chaos in the living space below. 
So what type of membranes? Obviously, it's got to meet those ANSI and ISO standards, so look for those. Again, like I mentioned, over and over again, ask the manufacturer. Make sure it's exterior rated and make sure it's correct for the type of application you're going to be using it outside. Uh, use the right membrane for the right application. Uh, I think Rob touched on a little bit on that. If, you, if you're going on top of a, uh, a deck, like I mentioned over here, a deck over an occupied space, not a cantilever balcony, but a, a deck over an occupied space, you got to make sure that you have to use a roof membrane as your primary membrane first. You can't just use a membrane that's not rated as a roof membrane. Uh, and it's, uh, obviously, you have to ensure the compatibility with all the different uh, pieces of the puzzle of, of, the, of the tile system. So got to make sure that the waterproof membrane is compatible with your, your tile, uh, tile mortar, and obviously any surface prep products that you need to use uh, if you're going to use a patch, uh, to kind of smooth out the concrete if it's a bit too rough or, you know, um, you know, mortar beds and things like that. So you have to make sure that the whole system is compatible with uh, with everything. And these are typical pictures. These are actual my pictures that I've taken over the years. Uh, a wrong mortar, a wrong tile mortar being used, right? And this is a deck. So this mortar didn't, it couldn't take that kind of expansion contraction, all the, 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 the wet, the uh, uh, the cold, the heat, uh, they, you know, they probably throw salt on there, right, uh, during the winter months. So if you see the picture on the right, you can see that the mortar, you pop off a tile, the mortar is basically disintegrated. You can actually see here, it actually turned to dust right here. It just, it's just done. It's like it's like chalk, right? So this is the thing, these type of the things that could happen if you, if you don't use the right tile mortar uh, for exterior applications. It's kind of hard to see here, but again, the wrong grout being used. Grout didn't have enough flexural strength, had too much porosity. Water got in it, froze, pop it out. If you look at the picture here, you can see the grout's completely out of the joint. You can just see a little piece of grout right over here, but over here it's all voids. The grout just basically popped out, right? And no waterproof membrane. What happens if you have no waterproof membrane? A lot of times it's something aesthetics, efflorescence. This deck, this is what it looks like. Now I'll explain to you a little bit about efflorescence. Uh, not to get too technical, but a lot of people I have I'm actually this job here that I went I went to see, the guy was telling me, well, my deck didn't have any efflorescence on the concrete before. I put installed tile, now there's efflorescence. So what's going on? Why is that? The reason being is what causes efflorescence? Efflorescence is a salt, a non-water soluble salt. So if it's called calcium carbonate. So if you take calcium carbonate, it's a salt, it's a powder. You drop it in a glass of water, it'll sink down to the bottom. You can stir it as much as you want and it ain't going to dissolve. So this is what happens uh, because a part of cement or concrete is lime. And lime is a water-soluble salt, so it'll dissolve. So what happens is, is when, um, uh, when you don't have a topping on concrete, it's just bare concrete, concrete is porous, air flows through it. That carbon dioxide in the air reacts with the lime inside the concrete turns into, into calcium carbonate, which is not water soluble. When it rains, everything evaporates, goes up. Now that lime turned turn into calcium carbonate. It's not going to dissolve. It's going to sit at the bottom inside the concrete and not go anywhere. So you don't get any efflorescence. Now, as soon as you put a tile system on it, now that concrete can't breathe, right? It's got very little porosity. You can't, it, there's no airflow through the concrete. So what happens is the concrete gets wet when it rains. That lime now is not converted into calcium carbonate. It gets wet, dissolves in water, goes up to the surface when it evaporates, exposed to the air, poof, calcium carbonate, and you get this nice little mess here. And the only way to get rid of calcium carbonate is to do an acid wash. Acid is the only thing that will break down uh, calcium carbonate. But obviously, you have to use a, 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 an acid that's suitable for your tile system. That's not going to etch your tile, especially if you have a natural stone tile. But it's a constant battle. You'll get rid of it with the acid wash, but then it'll just keep coming back up every time it rains. So that's the importance of using a waterproof membrane is not only for performance, but also for aesthetics as well, too. And that is it. I hope I didn't get too technical on you guys, but... <laughs> that was very, very fantastic, gentlemen. Both of you, thank you very much. Um, oh, do we have any questions that need to be, Lisa, do we have any questions for these guys that um, we want to discuss? I haven't seen any pop up in the 
in the questions, but if anyone has one, you're welcome to unmute and ask the boys. Uh, yeah, feel free to unmute your mic and ask your question if you have any. Anybody? <laughs> Somebody's got to have a question. Come on. <laughs> Making it easy on us. Or we explained everything, Paul. We did such a good job. <laughs> there are no more questions for exterior tile installations. <clears throat> Uh, the other thing I was going to note, if any of you need a certifi certificate for your um, viewing this, then for your CEUs, please just email me and I will send you one. Oh, we have a question. Yes. Does the right mortar waterproofing depend on the type of tile being installed and the substrate? Well, definitely. I mean, the type, well, the type of tile, obviously the tile has to be ready for the exterior use. So you got to have to ask the tile manufacturer or the tile distributor to make sure like that that tile is suitable for your application outside um especially on building facades too because you have wind loans on building facades so you have to make sure that that it can take the wind loads and uh, it's suitable for outside and obviously if you're installing a porcelain tile if the mortar is ready for outside then you're good to go if you're installing a natural stone that is all is good for outside ask the tile manufacturer and also the mortar manufacturer to make sure because uh, natural stone is a natural product. So it's, 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 it's not man-made. You can't predict how it's going to behave. So you have to make sure that the mortar, because there, there are some uh, types of um, natural stone that will actually deform uh, with a regular setting mortar. You have to use a rapid set. It could stain, certain mortars can stain the, uh, uh, the natural stone. So you have to, make sure that uh, that you're using the right mortar for that type of natural stone. And again, always ask, ask the tile manufacturer, tile distributor, uh, and the tile mortar manufacturer to make sure it's compatible. So there's a secondary part to that question was stone versus porcelain. Porcelain is very popular these days in Las Porous from Peggy as well. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Obviously, yeah. I mean, porcelain tile is is has is got 0 0.05 percent uh, to be rated to to be called a porcelain tile has to have point, less than 0 0.05 percent of moisture absorption. Uh, moisture absorption. Uh, but natural stone, uh, I mean, it comes from outside, right? It's, it's, it's excavated and in, 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 in quarries. It's living outside. It's made outside. Uh, it's gonna have certain process like limestone. It's gonna have a certain process, but you what you gotta take in consideration is uh when the manufacturer makes these natural stone tiles, it's not a big giant mountain, it's not a big mass. You're cutting it down to like you know a half inch, uh three eighth in, uh three eighths thick tile. And that's why you have to make sure that it's exterior rated, because if you're cutting a stone that thin, sometimes it can't take that kind of punishment outside uh because of its porosity. Um, and different attributes and, and the types of chemicals that are inside the stone. That answers the question, I hope. Excuse me, uh, Paul. Yes. Uh, Angelo here in Montreal. Uh, what about for, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, control joints, expansion joints, or or just the, the joint between the building and the terrace, or the, the add-on of the stairs when it's poured afterwards? Uh, any any particular design that you would suggest? I Rob, you want to take that one? That's your baby. Oh yeah, I can I can answer um, it too. But right, start. particular design. <laughs> I guess it all depends on what exactly like the expansion contraction joint is. Um, and I and I guess exactly what you mean by the design. Normally they're just filled with like uh, inappropriate sealant, usually a silicone of some sort, sometimes a polyurethane, uh, and then backer rod. Mm, yeah, I'm not sure. Are you are you talking about stairs or where the stairs meet the building facade? Well, e either the stair is built afterward, you know, and they, they they tie it into the building, and then there's that joint that always seems to be. Yeah, a, yeah, that that joint that joint, joint is going to be filled with a flexible sealant. Doesn't you can't put anything cementitious; yeah. it's just going to crack, and water is going to penetrate. So yeah. typically, what I've seen a lot is like uh, like Rob mentioned. I I typically see polyurethanes. It could be either a moisture cure things or even better a two part polyurethane uh, with a backer rock because usually typically those joints are fairly large. Yeah. Uh, in but yeah, definitely the don't want to put actually 
I'm going to plug the T, sorry, Paul, I'm going to plug the TT Mac because there's actually really good diagrams of exactly kind of what those types of joints should look like. <clears throat> so it's probably a better way to explain it. In your case, you would probably be looking for an actual expansion joint or, or mm -hmm. cold, mm -hmm. cold joint of some sorts. Okay. And we can cover these with the membranes you're suggesting? No, they have to be carried all the way up through, through everything, always. Okay. Yeah. Thank we you. didn't know he was plugging the book, but there you have it. <laughs> <laughs> always, always refer to it. Yeah, first. But sometimes, sometimes those diagrams do a better job of explaining something than, than I can, so. Okay, any other questions for our speakers? Okay, I believe this was uh, recorded. Lisa, correct? And it will be posted online. Uh, if you guys have any questions, please feel free to reach out to the TTMAC. We thank you for your time uh, and listening. Uh, and we'd like to thank our speakers, um, Paul and uh, Rob. You guys did a fantastic job. So thank you. Thank you very much. Much applauded. Your information was invaluable, really. And we appreciate your time. Uh, thank stay you for having us. Our next tech talk. Lisa, what are we scheduled for? We're scheduled for late April. <clears throat> then we're going to be looking back at DCOF. DCOF. Also, oh, nice. if you have any uh, topics of discussion that you want to hear <clears throat> about from us, please reach out to us and let us know what you want to hear about, and we'll do our best to arrange the best in the business and speak about it. So once again, thank you very much. We appreciate you, and we look forward to seeing you at the next session. Thank you again, Paul and Rob. Thank, thank you. Everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye, everyone. Thanks. Bye-bye.